All right. We are streaming and it's six o'clock. So we will call this board meeting to order. Welcome to all of you who are able to join. It's so good to see you all again. Um, it's always a pleasure to get together with you and uh, just one of the highlights for sure of my month is to join with you all. So we do have our guest presenter on our screen, Luke Kane, who's going to be presenting to us. And we definitely have quorum here tonight. We have four board members in the um, boardroom at Hemlock Knoll and uh, two on phone and the rest of you here on Zoom. So it's good to see you all. Since we have quorum, we will proceed. And we do have two visitors in the gallery, so to speak. And uh, Alex has advised me that they're at Arsenault and Jason Gaudet. So welcome to those who have, you, who have joined as guests and the members of the public. And we will give you a chance to ask questions at the end of the board meeting. Um, at this point in time, I would be asking any board members if they have a conflict of interest to self-declare it. It is your responsibility to self-declare any conflict of interest for anything on the agenda. Is there anything to note? Nothing to note. All right. Um, and I will just make some comments here um, before we formally proceed, um, just to make things smooth, because we are going to be voting on the adoption of the agenda. Um, but due to the nature of um, the technological meetings and the variety of technology that we use. Our bylaws do say that we're going to, uh, we have to vote by raise of hands, but it's not always easy to do that. Uh, the people on the phones only, of course, can't raise their hands and uh, it's hard to see everybody in the boardroom. So with the board's permission, due to the unique circumstances, we'll just poll the board for every vote um, just to make it easier. So we'll just go one by one and ask each yes or no and Claudette will record it that way. So I'll just ask for your liberty that way. The other point I would like to make is that our, our uh, regulations do require every board member to vote. So I respectfully ask that you leave your audio on so you can hear what's going on in the board meeting. You can keep yourself muted so we can't hear what's going on in the background where you are. Um, but do leave your audio on so that you can hear us uh, because when it comes time for a vote, we do, we do want to respect uh, the fact that every member should be casting a vote. So please be prepared for that. Just some housekeeping items as we adapt to the technology. Um, so with that, those comments made, we'll proceed. Um, the first formal item would be the adoption of the agenda. The agenda, draft agenda was circulated to you in your board package by Hollis. And I'll also note here, just as a side, that Hollis had a family emergency that came up yesterday. And uh, in his absence, a very necessary absence tonight, Alex uh, Henderson, who's our planning director, will be sitting in Hollis's stead. And as always, Claudette McLean, our uh, secretary to the board is with us. So I'm sure everything will go just as smoothly as it always does. So adoption of the agenda, as I mentioned, the draft agenda was circulated in your board package. So at this point in time, I would be looking for a motion to adopt as circulated. Oh. I'll make that motion. <laughs> I think I heard Winston there first okay. and then seconder. Faith. Faith. Okay. So we have a motion and we have a seconder to adopt the agenda as circulated. Are there any questions or discussion about the agenda or anything to note? Nothing to note. Ready for the question? All right. All in favor of adopting the agenda as circulated, we will go poll by poll. So we'll start with the boardroom. Dennis? Yes. Winston? Yes. Annette? Yes. Jim? Yes. Okay, then we'll go to the cameras. Doug? Yes. Carla? Yes. Alan? Yes. Heather? Yes. Ken? Perfect. Dick? Yeah. Thank you. Terry? Yeah. Wayne McQuarrie on the phone? Yes. And Faith Avery on the phone? Yes. And finally, myself. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have unanimous adoption of the agenda. The next item would be the adoption of the minutes of the August 27th, 2020 board meeting. And once again, they were circulated in the board package that went out. So we would be looking for a motion to adopt as circulated. Do we have a mover? So moved. So moved by, uh, <laughs> and I saw Ken put his hand up next. So we'll say, uh, so uh, Winston moved and Ken seconded. 
Any questions or discussion about those minutes that were circulated to you? Nothing to note. Ready for the question? All in favor, and this time we'll just mix it up so that's not the same people starting all the time. We'll start with Faith. Faith? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Heather? Yes. Ken? Yes. Dick? Yes. Terry? Yes. Alan? Yes. Carla? Yes. Doug? Yes. We do have some background audio there. Someone wants to mute themselves, that'd be perfect. Um, and then we'll go to the boardroom. Jim? Yes. Annette? Yes. Dennis? Yes. And Winston? Yes. And myself? Yes. So we have once again unanimous adoption of the minutes of the August 27th meeting. So with that bit of housekeeping out of the way, the first part of the agenda, we'll move on to the presentation, guest presentation. And Luke Kane is here. And this um, presentation has come out of the work of the Regional Collaborative Oversight Committee. And uh, although it pertains part most likely just to the municipalities, we did feel that since it was a board initiative at the last board meeting, uh, the board members decided that the entire board should have the opportunity to hear what's being presented just so that we know what the board is working on as a collaborative issue. So we welcome you, certainly Luke Kane, and we just ask you to take your liberty and uh, we're certainly pleased to have you here. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Um, as mentioned, I'm Luke Kane from Kane Insurance in Fredericton. Uh, we are a commercial insurance brokerage. Uh, we've been around since uh, 1986. And uh, one of our uh, core uh, groups of business is insuring municipalities and other public sector organizations in the province. Um, currently, we have approximately uh, 27 uh, municipalities that we provide insurance and risk management services to, and uh, including uh, a number uh, of your members of the, of the service commission. Um, when I was speaking with Claudette, she had mentioned to me that there was some questions with respect to the possibility of banding together uh, as a group and uh, trying to uh, market uh, that group to various insurance companies in an attempt to uh, hopefully reduce premiums and improve on, on terms and conditions. And uh, that is a, that's not an uncommon question to ask uh, by any group, uh, most particularly in an environment with uh, dramatically increasing premiums. And uh, I'm sure that each and every one of us uh, can confirm that our home and automobile insurance policies have been increasing quite dramatically in price. And uh, in the municipal insurance world, uh, that sector has not been spared by this uh, tough market conditions. Um, I want to emphasize that the, the tough market conditions that we're in right now are not the direct result of COVID. Um, you hear everything being blamed on COVID these days, but the problems in the insurance world are not, uh, are not created by COVID, but those problems are going to be extended. This uh, tough insurance market has been going on for about three years now. And it it's our uh, feeling, or it was our feeling that in 2021 or 2022, we'd see things start to improve and stabilize. These increases that insurance companies are asking for would have worked their way through their systems. They would have returned to uh, a little bit more uh, profitable uh, status. And uh, we, would, we would start to see the competitive nature of the business start to work its magic again. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And, and, uh, and unfortunately, again, the, this COVID uh, phenomena is going to extend it out, I think, for a couple of more years until things get, get settled. But on the topic of, of banding together uh, to try and save on premium and, and improve uh, terms and conditions, um, that's not a new concept. Uh, many organizations, many large employers, many employer groups, uh, unions and such, make deals with insurance companies to offer discounts uh, based on the size of the group and what have you. And perhaps, you know, if you're an employee of, of the provincial government or, or maybe, uh, you know, if you're an alumnus of UNB or something like that, 
you get marketed by these insurance companies and they are, they are specifically trying to get your home and automobile insurance and, and save you some money. Um, so, so that in, is what we refer to as group insurance in the property and casualty world for home and automobile insurance. In the municipal world, back in about 2005, I believe, uh, in, that, in that era, uh, Marsh Canada, who is uh, part of the largest insurance brokerage in the world, did a study uh, in New Brunswick uh, in an attempt to see if it, would be, um, if it would be viable to have the cities of New Brunswick come together to do uh, a group purchase for the municipal insurance. And uh, they had uh, put, invested a lot of time and effort into that study and they had a lot of uh, back and forth with the municipalities and at that time, it was decided that it, it would not be viable for a number of different reasons. And I'll, and I'll get into that uh, with, with you later. Um, there is currently uh, a group of municipalities in the province uh, who have banded together and who uh, purchase uh, insurance. I don't, I, I don't want to say that it's done as, as, a, as a collective, but there is a there's a common element among these municipalities, and they have they have uh, attracted uh, an insurance brokerage out of Quebec, and they they had a need of being serviced uh, in 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 their own uh, language, and that is what prompted them to to kind of come together, and that was the homogeneity that they felt that was needed, and and that's that's been the the genesis of of their uh, of their group. Uh, I can't speak to any premium savings or terms and conditions uh, because, uh, but I do know that one of the primary objectives of that group is to make sure that the, the documentation and the, the claim settlements and all those sorts of things are handled in, uh, in the language of their choice. Um, so, so that is happening in New Brunswick. Uh, and it's more based on language than it is based on, uh, on premium, as I understand it. The, uh, the, other, um, the other kind of uh, organization that is, is quite familiar to people in the insurance industry is called OMEX. And it's the uh, Ontario Municipal Exchange. And uh, OMEX was very popular years ago, and it was a reciprocal arrangement where um, a lot of <clears throat> municipalities came together and they essentially uh, formed um, something that looked and felt like an insurance company, but in the end it was not. Unfortunately, because of the market conditions, Omex has now depleted to only seven members. I looked it up online just before the, uh, the meeting tonight. And that, that was a very popular uh, insurance exchange for municipalities, but it, 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 it unfortunately is, is, is running its course. One of the things that uh, stands in the way of municipalities uh, banding together uh, to, to buy insurance as a group is that every municipality will always be viewed by itself in the eyes of the underwriter. And if you can think of, you know, if you had 10 municipalities together, all of which have their, have their different levels of assets, some may have fire departments, some may have police departments, some may have waste uh, facilities and, and others may not. Those are different risks that are brought to the insurer and the insurer will always want to underwrite those and charge an appropriate premium for those individual risks. So when that, if the concept is to bring them all together and share in the premium, then that means that everyone is gonna share in the losses. So when a couple of the members have bad years everybody's going to share in those bad years because no one's immune to it because you're looked at as a group um that is that idea of being in a group is a, is a great thing when premiums are declining it's not such a great thing when claims are bad and and premiums are increasing so the the idea of being individually rated within the group will will always be there the underwriter will never give up on that uh and and, and as i said the the downside of it is um 
is the this uh, the, these claims, which are which are a constant. Um, so so there are models out there where municipalities have have banded together. Uh, over time, they have had uh, different levels of success, and I would say at this particular point in history, um, the success level is low because of the poor market conditions that we are in. That having been said, um, I think that it is a, it's it's a it's a worthy it's worthy of further investigation, uh, so that the board or the committee can satisfy themselves that it is or is not uh, a good thing for them to do. The thing that would have to happen is similar to what was done in 2005 by Marsh Canada, a broker or some service provider is going to have to take on the task of, of putting, putting the package together, bringing all the information of the individual municipalities together and make an attempt to market that to the I'll say three uh, popular uh, municipal insurance providers in Canada, uh, namely uh, JLT Marsh, uh, the Frank Cowan Company, and uh, BFL Canada. And they are the two most popular in Canada, uh, and they would be the most likely to, to take a look at a group opportunity and be able to determine whether or not it would be acceptable or not. So, uh, I, 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 uh, I think the, the next step would be that, you know, the board or the committee um, would perhaps make a subcommittee and, and, uh, and make a determination on, on the next steps. Now, I'm giving you a lot verbally here this evening, and I'd be more than happy to, to write notes uh, and, and send it to you for, for your consideration. And uh, uh, I guess at this point, I just, before we go any further, I just wanted to ask if, if is there any questions? Is there some something I can ask uh, answer for you at this point? Right. Any board member who has a question, feel free to ask, Luke. So, yeah, I got a question. Uh, go ahead, Alan. So, uh, I, I understand the grouping, but could we not just be a guaranteed customer and then reap the benefits that way and not share the different aspects of our municipalities like just say look luke we're going to run with you and you give us a good discount as long as we all stay in in the pool but we're all still separate yeah i i think maybe what you're touching on is something that's becoming more and more popular uh in the municipal world um and i see uh, dick dick isabel is on on the line here this evening and, and dick's familiar with this but um, many many uh, municipal uh, municipalities have decided that they, they were better served by entering an, into an agreement with a broker and spelling out the terms and conditions under which that broker is going to provide services. And the broker is barred from accepting any commission from any from any insurance company for the placement of that business the broker charges a fee for the services that he that he provide he or she provides and the satisfaction of the municipality is gauged on not only the you know the success in the broker delivering on uh, you know a good price a fair price a market price but also lending some help and expertise to the risk management part of it because as we all know, as time goes by, there is more and more emphasis being put on proper risk management for municipalities and corporations and even individuals. And staff are tasked with trying to meet that high bar and that high expectation of, of improved risk management. So when a broker is engaged to, to do these things on behalf of the municipality under contract, and, and, and the key is being paid a fee, not a commission. So there's, there's no incentive for that broker to, to put that business with one insurance company or another. And um, the, the outcome is that the risk management goes up. Uh, hopefully the claims go down and the trend overall in time is uh, lower premiums because 
the higher the level of risk management, generally speaking, the lower the claims frequency and severity, and therefore it commands a lower premium. And uh, I, I, if, if I'm reading you, I think that probably lines up with, with, a, with a phenomena that is becoming more and more popular uh, in the municipal insurance and risk management world. It gets away from the public tender uh, where the emphasis is on, on the nickel. Uh, and if it's a nickel cheaper, we're moving. Uh, it, there's no doubt that it, uh, the insurance premium is of paramount importance, but in that same level of importance is the appropriate risk management and the appropriate terms and conditions to the, to the policies. Thank you. Are there any other questions from any board members for Lou? All right. Thank you, Luke. I appreciate your time. It was a pleasure to have you with us tonight. No, my, my pleasure. And uh, what I'll do is I'll follow up with some notes to Claudette for the board to consider. And uh, should, uh, should the board uh, wish to have uh, some more guidance in maybe taking the next step in investigating, you know, what the possibilities are, uh, we'd be more than happy to assist in that journey. It's excellent. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, good night. Night, thank you. Okay. So with that, we're uh, moving to the next part of the agenda, which is business arising from previous meetings. The first thing uh, that we'll look at is the regional housing strategy presentation. I believe this came out of PMC, Planning Management Committee. And uh, so the, the full report is done and Alex is going to present that, although it's been presented to PMC, it's never been presented to the board as a whole project. So that's what Xander is here for tonight. Xander, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you join us and just take your liberty. We look forward to this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I am, I have a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to share my screen for that. I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. Um, I do have some highlights from the report, but it's all online uh, as well as an executive summary. So um, if people are uh, further interested, I definitely encourage you to um, go through the whole thing. Uh, for those of you who are um, unfamiliar uh, or need a refresher, um, this is a regional study, but given certain constraints that I'll talk about to the end, we were focusing on the municipalities in the region. And uh, we in the planning department and um, I think, you know, municipal leaders and CEOs have, have known for a while that there are not enough to, of the right types of housing in the region. Um, we especially need more rental housing. The last time any kind of study like this was done was in 1996, and it identified um, a lot of the same issues that, that we found, uh, which means that they probably haven't been adequately addressed. Um, people are looking for smaller, more flexible ownership options. Um, and this isn't just kind of an individual problem. It's, it's an economic problem as well. Um, you know, the, the town of St. Stephen, uh, some of the businesses there have really struggled with housing employees. They have people who want to work there, but there's nowhere for them to live. And so they end up um, not being able to hire the employees and they have uh, staff issues because of it. Um, another major issue, which is, is starting to happen is seniors are downsizing. They don't want to live in larger homes they have to maintain anymore. Um, and they're looking for easier, uh, more accessible options that often means um, rental units. There are also health hazards from poor housing conditions. So uh, things like black molds, um, lack of heat, um, problems that are, are very related to poverty, um, which, and, which points to the need for more uh, higher quality affordable housing. So that's the problem. Um, and that's sort of what we knew anecdotally. Everything we've, we found through this research really supports that. And I'll go into those details later, but, but there's an opportunity here as well through uh, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, which is gonna change their name soon, um, which annoys me because all of the references to them will have to change, but that's, um, that's my problem. Uh, they released a national housing strategy back in 2015. 
um, which was offering lots of funding for soft costs and uh, forgivable loans and grants for capital costs. There were some requirements that go with it um, to access this funding. They, they wanna see partnerships uh, that could be between um, nonprofits and municipalities, uh, for-profit developers, municipalities. Um, generally municipalities or some level of government are, are required for that partnership. Um, and they're required to contribute something, but that can be land, which uh, if, if you go ahead and read the report, you'll see that municipalities in our region tend to have a lot of vacant land. They also need research and data, like, like any funder, um, they, they want to know that what they're funding is viable. Uh, and that's where the report and strategy come in, because um, we don't we haven't had that data. We haven't had that research. The municipalities and developers in our region um, really don't have the capacity to produce it to the level that CMHC is looking for. So a working group formed, uh, I think it was last year sometime, um, made up of Horizon Health Network, uh, the, the community health branch um, represented by Heather Chair and Cheryl Pepin, uh, vibrant community, Charlotte County, represented by Ray. And then of course we had um, SNBSC staff, myself, Alex and Vivian working on this. The areas covered, um, just quickly go through the table of contents. Uh, I won't go through all of this in the presentation. Um, we have municipal market data for all of the municipalities. Uh, so that's a combination of census data Inter, uh, interviews with landlords um, and, and a broader survey of residents. So we have that for all the municipalities. Um, and then the most important part, the conclusions, key findings, uh, figuring out exactly or at least an estimation of how much housing is actually needed for each municipality, recommendations of the types of housing and how to get it built. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we can't cover everything. Um, this is a very comprehensive study, but there's still gaps um, and uh, need for further research. Uh, and then a bunch of appendices. Again, very much encourage you to read the whole thing. So a quick, um, this looks like a lot of information, but what's really important to focus on here is the vacancy rate. This is data that we did not know before um, we went ahead and did this research. And it's something that um, finance, people who are financing new construction are always looking for. So uh, you're looking for about a three to 5% range. Um, and vacancy rate is the number of available units divided by the number of total units. So that gives you a percentage. Um, St. Stephen, Harvey, Grand Manan uh, are very, very low vacancy rates um, with the smaller municipalities having a very high data quality is challenging given um, the number of people you would have to talk to. So uh, do take some of this with a grain of salt. Um, St. Andrews and St. George are closer to being healthy but still need more units. And McAdam and Blacks Harbor um, are above that healthy vacancy range. Uh, in fact, you might have issues when you have a vacancy rate um, as high as those municipalities. And, and that, of course, the vacancy rate doesn't actually reflect condition or uh, affordability of the unit. So just because there, there's a higher vacancy rate doesn't mean that um, everything is fine. So what became very clear uh, when started looking at the data was that the market is not meeting the needs of renters um, the way it is meeting the needs of owners. So you can see here on this infographic um, that you have almost 50% of renters living in situations um, where uh, the level of maintenance is higher, extremely high, which is good, but compare that to owners and that's almost at 75%. Um, if you look at the difficulty finding housing, almost 70% of renters are having higher, extremely high difficulty compared to only about 20% of owners. Um, going further, uh, there's with, with space needs, um, owners are almost three times more likely to be living in the right amounts of space than renters are. Uh, and renters tend to be looking for more space um, as you know, they might be starting families. 
Uh, sometimes that means ownership, but that doesn't always mean ownership. It might be a larger rental option, which there are very few of in our region. So uh, as well, um, renters are much more likely to be spending more than 30% of their before tax income on their housing, which is um, CMHC's benchmark for affordability um, and much more likely to face discrimination in housing. Uh, so maybe being told things like, oh, you know, um, we don't rent to people with kids. Um, you, know, you have to put down some kind of uh, above what the rentals men requires for a, a deposit. Um, and while technically these may be illegal, it's, it can be very hard for renters, depending on their situation, to actually um, follow through on, uh, on their rights. So very different situation for owners and renters in our region. Um, I'm not going to go through all this in a lot of detail, but this is the number of new units needed. And uh, this is basically predicting the future based on the best available data, which is um, always challenging. And uh, we looked at this a few different ways. So first, how do you just get up to that healthy vacancy rate in a year with no change? Let's say you have 1% growth in that year. How many units do you need? And uh, when you start bringing in employment and potential future employment, those numbers really start jumping. And we had, uh, we had some great data from Future St. Stephen. They did a Charlotte County wide survey of employers and um, we were able to use that, which was, which was really fantastic. Um, and then in the bottom table, if you start adding in um, people who might want uh, really for apartments and rental units, we're, we're thinking more about people who want less space and people who want accessible space. So when you start thinking about the people who would move if they could to um, you know, uh, a more affordable unit, an accessible unit, or a smaller unit that requires less maintenance, those numbers um, really start jumping up. Uh, and those are for five years, not for one year. Um, but you can see the, the challenge ahead for our region. And, and if we're not able to create these units, um, you can see what some of the uh, downfalls would be. So it's not just about the number of units, it's about the right type of units. Um, affordable multi-unit apartment buildings uh, with some more space options, so more than two bedrooms, which tends to be mostly you're seeing one bedroom bachelors uh, and accessible units, seniors apartments. If I was a developer in this region, I would, absolutely be building seniors apartments right now. Um, and for that demographic, but as well as for, uh, you know, younger people starting families, um, some smaller standalone units that can be rented or owned, such as townhouses, tiny homes, mini homes, and garden suites. Some of the issues with those are in zoning bylaws, and that's something we've worked with municipalities already on. Um, there's a really big opportunity with some of the larger single family homes to convert them into uh, multiple units. So if, if someone's really having a hard time selling their larger home, um, there might be a developer who sees an opportunity there to convert. Supportive housing. So that means housing for folks who are uh, on the more vulnerable side of things and might need help with maintenance and upkeep. Um, there really is, is nothing like that in our region. And um, there are a lot of vulnerable people falling through the cracks. Uh, and these don't have to be standalone residential units. Um, mixed use development is um, a really good planning practice because it means that you're gonna see more walkability, um, especially when we start thinking about seniors. Um, it's really great when they can be living in a community where they can walk to everything they need, um, but that's good for everybody as well. So if you have amenities built into a building, um, that's obviously gonna make it much easier to get to. So uh, with all of this, we have some recommendations for stakeholders, uh, developers, nonprofit organizations, municipalities, the province, and of course, uh, SNBSC. And that's where the strategic plan, the regional plan really comes in. Um, and I'm going to go to the last slide and then I'm going to get out of the presentation and um, go through the strategic plan. Don't worry, it's less, it's a page and a half. It's very short. Um, but that's really what, um, you know, the research we've done 
is going to be helpful to all of these groups, but we do need some buy-in from the board on the strategic plan portion because it directly implicates the commission. So gaps and next steps. Um, we, didn't, we didn't look at LSDs at all. Um, and Campobello kind of falls into the same category, although we did, uh, we were able to get some data on Campobello. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in developing these types of units if there isn't municipal infrastructure and uh, there isn't some kind of municipal body that um, can, uh, you know, sign checks, be a partner, um, be a, a corporation in essence. Um, if you're looking to develop anything over four units, uh, you really need a sewer system or a very expensive septic system. Also, uh, best planning practice is to limit rural sprawl. Um, so while there might be opportunities in LSDs, it should be where there's already some level of density that might be in uh, Penfield or, or potentially Beaver Harbor. And um, I'm not going to explain what conservation subdivisions are, but they're, they're an exciting kind of new and old way of developing land in more rural areas that could meet some of those density requirements, um, but be done in a sustainable way. So if you're interested in that, I definitely encourage you to Google conservation subdivisions. Uh, there's also a need for emergency housing, and that could be for vulnerable individuals, but we also got to think about natural disasters and COVID um, and where if you lost housing, it might have been a lot easier to go stay with a friend or family member. Um, that's more challenging in the days of COVID. Um, you know, we've, we've been fairly lucky in our region to avoid a lot of natural disasters, but um, you know, a hurricane comes the wrong way. And um, given where we are on the coastline, we could have lots of people who need to evacuate quickly and, and where are they going to stay? So this clearly relates to emergency planning and the EMO. Um, and there's further discussions needed on this. What's really, really important as far as next steps is to publicize. So oftentimes these reports, uh, they get put on a shelf and there's really great research and data in them, but they don't go anywhere and developers don't really pick them up. So to that end, we already have a website, swnbhousing.ca um, that has the report on it, the executive summary, uh, standalone data. So you don't have to go through a whole report to find it and contacts. Um, we're also uh, thinking about doing a press release um, where we could uh, put something in the Telegraph Journal, the Courier, um, CHCO to really get the word out. And uh, we had initially talked about doing a symposium for developers in person. Uh, that was back in, in uh, the good old days. So what we're thinking about now is maybe some webinars, um, one for municipalities, one for developers. They could be recorded so it doesn't really take up too much of, uh, of my time. Um, and that could be you know, a, help, a helpful guide to let people know that this is out here and that um, there are lots of opportunities. So um, I'm gonna switch screens quickly just to go through the actual strategic plan or the regional plan. That was kind of the study that informs the plan and this is uh, the Southwestern Brunswick Service Commission Plan for Housing. Uh, it's very simple, similar to um, the Regional Recreation Plan and the uh, Climate Change Implementation Plan. Um, so this is something that would be adopted by the board. And um, I think what's, what's important here and what people should know uh, is that the scope of this is to develop slash implement a comprehensive master plan for integrated regional service. Um, sorry, these are these are uh, SNBSC's uh, general strategic plan, but this very much fits into that. So the actual plan policies, there's only two of them. SNBSC support affordable multifamily housing development in the region through the actions contained in Appendix A. And two, SNBSC shall have regard for the data contained in Southwestern New Brunswick Regional Housing Study. That's kind of what I was just talking about in any future regional plan adopted by SNBSC. 
And the Appendix A that that first policy is referring to is SNBSA, SNBSC to offer planning and site planning guidance for entities seeking to carry out affordable multifamily housing developments, um, periodically generate and publish research on the regional housing market. So this study, if it's updated in five years, and that's kind of a continual thing, um, we're, we're getting, we're always getting a new snapshot in time. And uh, SNBSC can be a regional resource for navigating funding opportunities for affordable multifamily housing development. Um, and that might be as simple as just giving the study to uh, developers who, who are interested in the area. So that is a very quick run through of the study and the regional plan that, it's, uh, that comes from it. And I am more than happy to take any questions on that now. And there, there might be questions that Alex um, also can answer. I, I had a question. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, is it possible, and you might have mentioned this, that we could get a copy yeah. of um, the plan and, and um, the, the regional plan based off the other one, like so that we could have time to review it? Yeah, I think we had hoped it would be sent to the board before this, but um, we know that you haven't, I think, except for the PMC, we haven't seen it. So we're not expecting any kind of decision on this tonight um because because you you obviously need to have time to see it so i think we'll we'll get it sent out um first thing tomorrow probably to everybody yeah if you, you want i'll put in the chat box here the link for the website so if you want to see the full report um and the executive summary um you can go to that website okay i have a question go ahead uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the guidance that you are proposing to offer, would that be offered with the existing staff that we have? And is this uh, something that would be uh, uh, a fee for, or would you anticipate hiring more staff or just want a, a bit of a, an idea there? So I'll, I'll answer that. And Alex, if you want to jump in, um, go for it. No, I don't think we're anticipating hiring more staff. A lot of this is very similar to the work that we're already doing in the planning office, like the work we do with municipalities. Um, when we're, we're going through zoning bylaws and municipal plans. Um, we're already looking at how do you increase your housing. Um, where I think it um, starts getting into new areas is potentially with developers, although we, you know, we will have developers come to us with site plans and um, based on documents, we have conversations with them about how to produce um, better, more effective site plans. So I, I don't see it as being a huge jump in uh, capacity or, or hours. Um, I see it very much fitting it into the work we already do. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Xander? <laughs> Madam Chair, if I could, I just wanted to maybe add to that. Yes, Alex, go ahead. So um, when we were looking at this, uh, this issue kind of came up through some earlier board discussions, actually way back with Tara Devlin, uh, highest when she was uh, working at OME. Uh, this kind of idea, I think, has been developing for some time. Uh, but we knew, even as Xander said, if we're going to go and uh, assist a municipality with developing its own municipal plan, we need to do this housing market research each and every time we go to update a bio. So, in reality, there's an, a, there was a cost efficiency for us to do it all at once. But then, when it comes to the idea of, of doing something that's a little bit extra, a little bit beyond, what the service commission's uh, strict mandate is, uh, it's your decision as the board. So that's where that uh, that policy and those actions, if you wanted us to, uh, if you wanted to adopt that, you know, those were things we could do really just uh, just with the existing employees. Um, and it's kind of uh, it's kind of like this. Oh, did you know CMHC offers this thing? Uh, it's 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 really not um, uh, a significant workload and uh it is a kind of a regional thing uh, so we do have in every budget every year we've had in the last number of years we have a certain 
small budget there for regional planning. So in a, in a sense, this uh, kind of regional effort to put out some regional data that assists with planning, it kind of fits within the mandate there, but um, it is a, it's a new area. So that's why it's, I think, brought to the board. Thank you, Alex. Definitely, we'll have that. I, th I believe the strategy plan itself was sent out to the board, but not the policy, proposed policy document um, in advance. So we'll definitely take time to peruse that and really think it through and discuss it. Um, one thing that I will be bringing to the table to discuss is um, when it comes to affordable to affordable housing, I can speak from both sides, both sides of the issue, both as having been a renter prior and, and a homeowner now and being a landlord and the challenges as a landlord of being able to provide that uh, affordable housing um, and keeping rents as low as possible and the challenges that, that come with that. Um, so I, I will definitely, I know Terry has, has owned rental units before and, and some others on the board have. So there are challenges from the landlord perspective and being able to meet that need as well, while still staying viable, um, because not every landlord is a kill em group, you know, a multi million dollar, if not billion dollar enterprise. And uh, there are challenges for the small landlords in, in, in meeting that objective as much as you would like to. Um, and a lot of it relates to the costs that are directly passed on to landlords through double tax and, uh, and uh, municipal water and sewer and things like that being charged per unit rather than on the building. So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting discussion. I am really looking forward to it because I think, and I've seen it myself, knowing people who who need a place to live and there's just no vacancies in St. Stephen. So, it's it's a challenging, challenging situation. It's going to make some for some interesting discussion. Are there any other questions for 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 Xander or Alex from the board members? None noted. Thank you, Xander. It's been a pleasure, and I'm sure we'll be talking to you again. Yeah, look forward to it. Thanks. Have a great meeting. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. So we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. At the last board meeting, we, we did adopt a climate change adaptation um, policy. And we also authorized the use of ETF money uh, to hire a climate change adaptation plan implementer. And the executive committee did ask Hollis to update the board as to how that uh, process was carried out, uh, not necessarily give a name, but tell us how, how the process ended up being and how the uh, person was or, or group was hired and uh, what, what the next steps are. So I'm assuming, uh, Alex, that you are able to present that in Hollis' stead. If not, we can certainly come back to it another time. No, it's fine. I, I don't think it gives us uh, as much uh, update as Hollis uh, may be able to at this time. But just briefly, um, uh, there's this, uh, we're still we're still kind of determining the contractor situation and direction. Uh, and we have some communications with ETF about that because I guess when we applied for the funding originally, um, we put in the budget amount for uh, staffing on a term basis, but I think what really what we were um, intending to do was hire a contractor. So it may have just been the way we filled out the application initially. So we have to have that revised and approved by ETF. We're, we're, we have limited time here, obviously. So we're gonna kind of see where we, what we can get done with the limited time. Um, but I would recommend you might wanna bring this back to the meeting uh, next month for a more wholesome update. Because it really isn't at this time a lot to a lot to share with the board, unfortunately. Okay, well, it's good to know that there was a little hiccup, so it's always good good to know, even if it's just that little bit. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate that. Are there any questions for Alex about that? I think it's pretty clearly explained. There's just been a hiccup, and nobody's actually been contracted or hired yet. All right, so we'll move on to new business. Uh, the draft budget questions arising, and again, Hollis would have been probably the more appropriate one to, to ask any questions of, but we certainly do understand that in extenuating circumstances, we can't always get all the answers we need. But were there any questions coming back about the draft budget that was circulated for the municipalities and LSDs? Were there any questions on that, that even if they can't be answered tonight, can be gathered by staff over the next little bit and brought back to you? Terry? Um, just, uh, I had one request that, um, council wanted to, uh, have a copy of our strategic plan with an indicator as to where we're at in that 
strategic plan. So I was going to ask uh, staff to uh, forward that. All right, and I believe the up, there's always an update in the board package as well, Terry. Yeah. Yeah, and I believe I mean, you can- Just to pull it all together into one document that would make it uh, more concise. And uh, um, Claudette, do you help Hollis with uh, organizing that and keeping that file? I know I don't, but I have just added it to an action point to put it- to Okay, one. perfect. I appreciate it, thanks. Well, Thank you, Terry. Any other questions about the draft budget that was circulated? Anything that should be checked into for you? All right, so with that portion of the discussion done and no more questions arising, we'll move on to committee and staff reports. The executive director's report, again, Hollis isn't here to present, but if there's anything that he wanted the board to be aware of specifically um, or presenting in lieu, it would be Alex in his stead tonight. Alex, do you have anything for us or are we going to uh, have uh, Hollis um, circulate that via email when he's back at it. Already in your package. Yeah. Just I can do the highlights if you want, Madam Chair. Certainly, if you want to, but the report is in your package, as Claudette noted. If you want to, Alex, go ahead and note any highlights that Hollis would normally highlight. Uh, so just to note that solid waste is a little bit down this year. I don't know the full in ins and outs of that part of it. So that may be something to note if you have questions about that. Planning uh, permits are uh, are way up, and that's uh, part in fact uh, part due to the fact that St. Stephen has uh, uh, signed up for a planning development service through the commission. Um, and uh, other news, COVID, where Hollis is monitoring the COVID nineteen pandemic response and adjusting operations accordingly. So keeping in mind a second wave potential, but stay tuned. Uh, Tanya Harrington, the recreation implementer, has um, uh, gone to ma ma maternity leave, and we've uh, we've hired a 12-month uh, replacement for her position. And I will note, I want to pause here because I mentioned to Hollis that we do need to have a motion from the board, um, and I think it's either um, this month or it possibly could be pushed to October, but uh, for the board to um, to agree to do another year. Uh, it's kind of a formality at this point because I think they're, the tourism marriage culture is uh, really seeing the progress that's been done in this file, but, uh, but we, do, we do technically need a motion. I did ask uh, Claudette that if that, uh, the funding for that position is reflected in next year's budget for the commission, and you guys have budgeted for that, at least, um, so it's in the budget, the draft budget as it is now, but um, tourism heritage culture is looking for some copy of a resolution or motion made by this committee or board, sorry, um, to have uh, a commitment to fund that position for the 2020-2021 uh, 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 year. So um, I will leave that to you guys to decide what you'd like to do. Uh, I'll take questions on it too as well, but uh, that's just a, a little add in here that I did mention to Hollis and he was going to bring that up if he was here tonight. Uh, the, uh, uh, on the note of recreation as well, the, uh, the first pavement for the, the Coast Swing Trail is uh, taking place and it's in the St. Stephen uh, Waterfront Trail. So if anybody's had a chance to go look at that, it's a beautiful piece of infrastructure. And that's the, the first real leg of the Coastal Link Trail. So really cool to see that happen. Um, as I said, planning department's quite busy. And Hollis has been splitting his time between Lawrence Station and the office there. Um, we just have a lot of things on the go. Like I saw the housing piece, that's a, that's a new thing. And so just a lot of things to keep uh, his attention. Uh, with regard to the landfill, the final filters per currently being uh, completed and they expect it to be in operation for winter. Um, the final step, uh, there'll be a final step in the treat, treat, treatment system uh, upgrade project still. Um, and they're currently doing a site-wide fiber optic network system upgrade. And you can see some of the photos that also included in that report showing that work being done. So that, that will lead to a lot of efficiencies here at the landfill with regard to um, some of the systems they have in place. So going to avoid phones, which are much cheaper than, uh, 
in a traditional analog, which we use at the planning office as well, and it uh, works quite well. And uh, Wi-Fi and no cell service here at the site, as all you are mostly aware, coming to meetings here in this location, it can be a challenge. So all that work is, uh, is moving along nicely. So that concludes the executive director's report. And uh, I can take questions I, if there is any that I can answer to the best of my ability. Are there any questions for Alex from the board members about that uh, executive director's report? Bye. I'll get my hand up. Ken? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, yes. I think, uh, and uh, Dennis and uh, Winston could probably uh, either validate, validate or deny this statement, but I believe when we went through that budget, there was funding uh, for that position uh, in the 2021 budget. Is that not correct, guys? Yes, there is. Um, yeah, I, so. it, I can certainly speak to that as well. It was, she was hired on a four year, as far as the SNBSC, we budgeted in it for four years. Uh, however, it's just a formal motion that the um, uh, Tourism, Heritage and Culture is looking for um, as, as a measure to release their portion of the funding, but it was a four year plan and that was agreed to with um, Tourism, Heritage and Culture right from the beginning when we did that. So it is in the budget, absolutely. If, if you need a motion, I can make the motion that we fund our uh, portion for that position uh, for 2021. Perfect. We have a motion on the floor from Ken Stanix that uh, formalizes the funding for the recreation plan implementer for the 2021 budget year. Do we have a seconder for his motion? So Alan, Alan had his hand up. Thank you. Are there any questions or discussion about the need for this motion? to formally put into our budget, the recreation plan implementer. No questions or discussion? All right, well, are you ready for the question? We'll go, uh, we'll do a poll of the board again. Again, this is just for the sake of ease where we're using so many different means of technology tonight. So we'll start this time with Carla. Carla? Yes. Thank you, Ken? Yes. Terry? Yes. Alan? Yes. Heather? Thank you. I see the yes. Sam Walsh? Yes. Thank you, Dick? Yes. Okay. We'll go to the phones. Faith? Yes. Wayne? Yes. We'll go to the boardroom and we'll start this time with Annette? Yes. And then we'll go to Dennis? Yes. Winston? Yes. Jim? Yes. And finally, myself, and I say yes. So we have your unanimous, uh, thank you, Ken. We have a unanimous yes to your motion. So we have the formal motion for tourism, heritage, and culture for another year for our recreation plan implementer. Thank you all. Any other questions for Xander, um, not Xander, Alex, regarding is a stand-in for the executive director's report. None noted, we'll move on to the next report, which is the strategic plan update. And normally again, Hollis presents that. It is in your package. And he was kind enough to put uh, the updates to, that happened this month, anything that's been worked on is bold. Um, so uh, you all have a copy or should have a digital copy, uh, copy of the uh, first plan that was adopted and then the updates that have been noted at each board meeting. Um, however, they are usually in a chart format and this one's in a written format. So um, Alex, are you prepared to just hit the highlights for the things that have been highlighted in that report? Yeah, sure thing, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, one thing to note, uh, so you see all the, all the areas that have already been there from previous reports, so I won't need to go in there, but uh, regional economic strategy. Uh, Paulson actually just had a conversation with uh, David Campbell, who's a he's a he's an expert in this area, and asked him just to, for a, for a very small cost, uh, uh, put together basically an opinion piece. Uh, he's a bit of a provincial expert in this area, and to give an opinion piece of what kind of role a regional service commission could have here. So that will be brought back to the board when it's complete. 
So it's, uh, as I said, it's a minor uh, kind of a, uh, unbudgeted expense, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's not a very big thing. So uh, I think we'll, I think it'll be good value for very little amount of money spent there. So I, I guess stay tuned for that. I think we'll have something uh, perhaps in a, in October. So I don't know what time frame calls will want to. Uh, analyze that, bring that to the board. You may have some back and forth with that that guy, the gentleman there that, that does the kind of work. So other than that, uh, the landfill gas plan yet to be established, um, but they are uh, doing some planning with um, uh, piping and the foundation uh, for connections to the current infrastructure for that um, that uh, gas plan that was uh, laid up to the board uh, for 2021. Uh, the planning office has uh, energy efficient upgrades. So we have new windows, LED lighting, additional insulation. So it's a, it's, that's in a very energy efficient and tight building. So it's, uh, I, I work there uh, every day. So I can say it's a, it's a superb job that um, the commission staff, uh, John, John Cliff has done with that and under Hollis's direction, um, an excellent project. Uh, so. I think it will be a it will be a good uh, uh, energy efficient building for the long term. With regard to the recreation master plan uh, implementation, uh, I mentioned in his uh, ED report the first leg of the Coast Link Trail is um, is is put in the ground. Now, they're, from talking with Sherry Stewart, who's the replacement for Kenya for the twelve month period, um, there. They're actively planning for a, a ribbon cutting with the with the town and other officials who've been involved all all steps of the way, and uh, the signage is is getting close to uh, being finalized. So if, I've seen some early prototypes and it looks fantastic. So um, that's that's a really exciting thing. So that's basically all the updates I think you've seen. Uh, Perfect. Seen. That's the strategic plan updates. Are there any questions or comments? On that update, we'll go to Terry first. I just have a couple. Um, I was asked about the CPC meetings. Uh, our representative has been going. They haven't been held, I guess, because of COVID. Any idea when they're going to start again? I think that's probably a question that Hollis will need to answer. I doubt. I have my doubts that Alex is... Um, uh, Dennis, did you have, we'll go to Dennis next if he had his hand up, uh, but I do know we discussed that executive committee, uh, Terry, as well, and, and we can have Hollis, if, if we can't get the answers tonight, we can certainly have an action point for Hollis to update us once he's back. Okay. Um, Dennis, did you have your hand raised, sir? I'm just going to hit a qualify. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we weren't having an auction. <laughs> you might have just bought something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And if I could just say on a personal note that I am really excited for the trail. Um, I love to take my kids. We often go down to St. Andrews to take our bikes down to the Van Horn Trail there because um, there's not a lot of safe spaces to ride, uh, not a lot of wide shoulders in the rural areas and uh, don't necessarily want to ride on the roads. And I love taking them down. And I was in discussions with somebody um, prior to the election when I was at an event and someone was um, as people are wont to do, complain about tax dollars being used to pave a trail. And I, I really was able to put a plug in and say how it really helps people with special needs and who need mobility devices to be able to stay active and knowing people who really need that. And if it wasn't for some paved areas and uh, nice smooth areas, wouldn't be able to enjoy the outdoors. So I'm just really excited to see that this is coming to fruition and that the uh, Service Commission has played a part in that. And I think you all just deserve a big pat on the back for having worked together. Um, starting back years ago to get this done. It's exciting and I uh, see our friend Alan McCacron kind of being at the helm of that with the town. So congrats to all of you. I'm just really thrilled. And I think it's excellent to see. Are there any other questions or comments? None to note? No, okay. All right, so we have our um, strategic plan update and we'll move on to our RCO Regional Collaborative Oversight Committee report. Terry James, Mayor of Blacks Harbor is the chair of that committee. So Terry, uh, take your liberty and present your report. Okay, um, you'll find you have a copy in your packages. 
Uh, this committee met on uh, September 10th, a virtual meeting. Um, a summary of uh, the committee activities uh, where we had a great update, a positive one on recycling from uh, Tricia Dickerson, who reported on tonnage. The white goods program will end this year on October 31st. Um, uh, there was a conversation held with uh, Dick Isabel on recycling rates for Camp Abello, and he was pleased to note that the diversion rates are up. Termination of contract with Societe Via is in the process, and we will be moving forward with JS Ballas out of Woodstock, and their customers will remain relatively the same. Three are large Canadian companies and of course uh, new flyers reusable bags and the truck signs are all in print the 2021 calendar is uh, being put together and they have a contest running now for a chance to get uh, their submitted recycling photo uh, put on the calendar and with, re with regard to the recreation update given by tanya harrington uh, she introduced uh, Sherry Stewart, her replacement for maternity leave. Eastern Charlotte SRRF committee update. The investment into the existing facilities and into recreational staff falls in line with the regional staff strategy for cost sharing. The proposal to see a new facility built and supported through an additional two cents could be overseen by the SNBSC board if the board supports the policy that is proposed. The RCO will oversee the policy on cost sharing of recreational um, services and bring forth their recommendations uh, to the board. Um, concern was raised with the need for further clarification and we uh, need a much needed discussion uh, was identified and, and will be addressed in future meetings. The regional recreation website, a grant was approved from the province and Fundy Community Foundation. And with regard to cost sharing, positive feedback from the Committee of the Whole. Staff would like to propose a timeline to see the policy reviewed and then rolled out. And um, the Coastal Link Trail has been given $70,000 grant in addition to the 1 million given by the province. St. Stephen construction is delayed by at least a week. And with there being no further business to discuss, the meeting adjourned at 3.40. Any questions? No, that concludes my report. Thank you, Terry. All right. So we'll move on to bylaw committee report and Jim Tubbs is in the boardroom and he's the chair of that committee. So Jim, do you want to <laughs> present your report, please? It's a very quick and uh, repetitive report. The committee met again this month and uh, worked on the bylaws. Uh, we have uh, had to do some rewording in some of the areas. Uh, several updates had to be made. We've got uh, a planning on at least two more meetings over the next couple of months. And we're hoping that uh, a, a final report is gonna be forthcoming soon. And uh, just, just so that you know, one of the things that has come up was in, in the bylaws that were originally uh, handed down to the service commissions, it said one thing, but then um, the uh, service commission acts said another. So it's created kind of some challenges just knowing which was right. They draw, they gave us our bylaws, our draft bylaws from the beginning that contradicted themselves. So we're finding some issues like that that we're having to get clarification on through the regulations and acts. So it's a, uh, it's led to some interesting discussions for sure. So, and uh, even not just for us, but Hollis among the other dire executive directors and with the with the province and department of ELG. So it's been interesting. Um, any questions for Jim? None to note. We'll move on to the technical advisory committee report. Winston is the chair of that committee. He's a mayor of Harvey. Winston, take your liberty. Thank you, Madam Chair. We had a meeting the other night and uh, 
they brought us up to date on uh, some of the work we've done out there. The aeration system is, is, has been purchased and put in by staff instead of uh, a company coming to put it in, which it showed that it uh, works extremely well. The, uh, the uh, work for the next couple of years is 2022, I believe, the cell will be finished. Uh, the new cell will be all done. We've had a little problem with the with seepage of uh, chemicals and stuff in, into the pond, but they, they think they have that covered pretty well now too. And all the things have been straightened out with uh, with Paul's contractors and stuff. They're all done, and everything else is done there. And they've been paid, and we've been paid, I guess. But they also had a, a nice uh, cost effective electricity from waste, which is uh, something that's been sent out by the uh, Bundy Gold. And it's, uh, it's an energy thing that uh, it's a machine that, that uh, will, uh, will destroy uh, PCBs and DDT and use tires for. Uh, uh, gas or, or electrical supply and it's it's quite interesting it's, it's quite a booklet that they gave out but the, <clears throat> the thing is that i think it's quite expensive too and the reason i think one of the reasons they came here they had Beldoon on their site but they came here because this is a bigger area and and there's more room to, to work and store stuff which they said they'd have to like, store tires and things to use, but it also is close to the gas line and is close to, to the border for exporting electricity. So that was very interesting and that was about it. We had a very good meeting. They brought us up to date on all the work being done and everything going forward in the future. And that's my report. Thank you, Winston. Are there any questions from any board members about Winston's report? Questions or comments? I'm just wondering if we get a copy of the of uh, the booklet that was handed out. You got it. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Oh, Very Winston. Okay. I, I, I think I think it's quite an expensive proposition, but I think the government and uh, different companies, I think, are involved in it. But whether it ever happens or not, it'll be something else. So perhaps an action point could be made that the PDF be, be distributed to, to the entire board and then we can look in and at least uh, see see what's uh, been just, pardon very, me. They have three, different, three or four different plants around the world now that's working in. in okay. The and it might be something that the executive committee would like to see brought on an agenda so the entire board can see kind of the proposal that's being made for the facility, just to know what's uh, being presented to our region. Um, so mm -hmm. that would be awesome. That's interesting. We had the small modular reactors um, presentation to the board as well. So it's yeah, always nice. Yeah. It's nice for the board to see all of these these uh, concepts that are interested in our site and uh, or in our support. So it's it's nice for the board to see that. So we'll probably probably be seeing more of that in an upcoming board meeting. Um, are there any other questions or comments about the tech uh, tech committee report? And it isn't in your package because they just met, so it wasn't prepared, of course, with the emergency. Um, but we can certainly have that circulated um, after the fact, the, the report. We'll move on to Finance and Audit Committee report. And once again, Winston is the chair of that committee. So Winston, I'm take the chair. Uh, it says, me, was, Joyce was not able to attend and send her regrets. So that's the first line. Why they put that on there, I don't know. But want me to read it for you. So, uh, <laughs> Jeff Mitchell attended the meeting via Zoom and gave a presentation on the commission's portfolio summary, the investment policy statement review, the performance review, and the GIC maturity schedule. Mark Porter gave a background history of the closure fund liability, the operations lifespan of. The landfill has been increased, creating a large surplus in the budget. And that's the, the budget we set aside for reclaiming the land. Uh, it will need to be addressed in 2021. And I think 
the top of top my head, I think it said probably seven eight hundred thousand dollars to be transferred back to the to the landfill because of being extended. It's going to be uh, we don't need to put as much money. In. And uh, Jeff suggested the investment policy statement be reviewed and revised by the committee and brought forward to the board for approval. He will also be available to attend future general meetings to present options and recommendations. And he had two or three recommendations at, at the time just off his head, what to do with the money and how to do it. And Oh, Ken Stanick, he volunteered to do the annual inventory control site visit, and Mike will be in contact with Ken to set a date and time. And there was no motion, so to be brought forward. Thank you. Any questions for um, Winston regarding the Finance and Audit Committee report? Questions or comments? From the board members. Ken? I would just like to add one thing, Winston. Um, the, uh, the main thing that we were talking to our representative, financial representative about, uh, was that we're talking about that seven, eight hundred thousand dollar number, uh, was how to unwind uh, the funding uh, within the within the investment portfolio. There's a there's a strategy uh, 50% was into GICs and money market accounts and the other 50% is in the stock market and those kinds of things. Uh, so there's a, um, as you start to unwind that, uh, we were looking at GICs, but if you couldn't unwind all the GICs at the same time because that would have thrown uh, the averaging out. So that was uh, the, the main purpose of that meeting was to give him a heads up that we wanted to unwind that funding and to give him two or three months in order to come up with a methodology on how to do that uh, given the current guidelines that that he's working under so that's uh he's gone back he's going to come back to us and talk to us in a couple of months uh, to the board and as a whole and then give us a further update on what he's recommending on how that unwind should take place Thank you, Ken, for those extra comments. Are there any? And yeah, uh, we thought, we thought uh, Madam Chair, it was going to be a shock to him when we said we want to take money out, but he, <laughs> he seemed to uh, be quite pleased with it and said that, you know, as, as Ken had said, there's different ways to work this and different things he can do and uh, to make it work even better, I think, for us. And, and just, Excellent. Thank you. And uh, I think the reason that my regrets are there is because I had every intention of, of meeting my day job. Um, my boss is very, very good to me. I have the liberty to leave and go to meetings and he, he will not to dock my pay if it's under a certain amount of time uh, per day or per week. And he's very, very good to me that way. And I had every intention of meeting the last two finance and audit committee meetings. I'm not just an ad hoc member, I'm actually on that committee. But every time, even though I'm allowed to leave, circumstances don't always allow me to leave. Um, so I wasn't able to miss the last two. So I did have to extend my regrets at the last minute and uh, ask the committee members for understanding. So it is a, a very disappointing thing for me personally when I can't make a meeting. Uh, we I put the same, the same thing that when we try to get away from doing something to come to a meeting, so. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, that's I think they just put it in there so you know I'm not just skipping out playing hooky. <laughs> so, all right, any other questions um, for um, Winston? None? All right, financial report. And this well, falls under the auspices of the Finance and Audit Committee. And Winston is the chair of that committee. So Winston, once again. Well, it's all written out for you here. And it's all top of wood. Uh, they said that the uh, tipping fees were down a little bit. I think this there was two or three different things that, uh, that mixed in there. I think Paul was saying about why there's not as much coming in as there should be, but he's quite hopeful we're going to meet the target and uh, it's going to be there. And, and some of the other things we talked about the other night too was the, the new place to distribute the stuff, like you bring uh, building materials in, it's 
throws a search spot, the next door to it, it might take something else. So people aren't going to be traveling all over the site, dropping pieces off here and there. So that that was a, a good thing. It's supposed to be done next year. I'm loading, I'm loading the public drop-off yeah. site. Yeah, the public uh, drop-off site. That's been something that's kind of been discussed for a couple of years. So it's nice that it's uh, going to be going to be uh, coming to some sort of fruition or at least getting started. So are there any oh. other que any questions or comments for Winston? And to, certainly if you want to take the time to peruse those financial statements, um, and, and if you- They're all in the package there. And you can they're see all in the package. Well, yep. we don't have any deficits right there on, the, on any of the pages of dicing so far. So it looks all look pretty good. And we're all tracking along and there's nothing that seems to be like it's going to be showing up a big discrepancy at the end of the year. Uh, from uh, what we're seeing versus what we budgeted for. So that's always a good thing. So if you have any questions afterward, if you dig into them a little further and have any questions, certainly don't hesitate to reach out uh, to reach out later. Certainly not averse to that. Questions or comments? Bye. That's everything I have. Thank you, Winston. I appreciate that. All right. So with that, we are at the end of our agenda. Certainly has been a good meeting and we've uh, had a lot of good discussion and a lot of, you guys are just a great bunch. When you look at our uh, agendas and our minutes and the amount of things that we discuss and the amount of things that we bring to the board and stuff that uh, like cost sharing, it may be a lot of regions would just not even want to bring to the table. You guys are just bringing it to the table and freely, freely discussing and, and really you're just a great bunch and uh, you deserve a pat on the back for at least being able and willing to discuss the hard subjects and the new subjects. So. Kudos to all of you. You're a great bunch. Pat yourself on the back. You deserve it. So date and time of next regular board meeting, October 22nd per standing motion. It would be the fourth Thursday of every month, which in October would be October 22nd, 2020 at 6 p.m. Um, Hemlock Knoll, Zoom, phone, all kinds of methods to join in. So unless there's a motion otherwise, the standing motion uh, will continue on for October 22nd. I've got a question there, Joyce. Yes, absolutely. We Dennis. didn't uh, have a chance to uh, get back to Terry on her report. I was just wondering if anybody had seen the uh, marketplace on recycling over the weekend. It was quite a it was quite an eye opener for me because it said there's only nine percent of the recycling that is actually being done in Canada and being done properly. And, and I was just wondering if we can get a result as to where our recycling is going and what is happening to it. Um, absolutely. Terry, did you catch that? He would like to I come did. back to. I was just uh, reflecting and um, I, I know it said there was three large Canadian companies that purchased uh, the recycling, but I'll get clarification from Trisha and uh, send out a note to the board. I know when it was going to Society Via, if I remember the statistics correctly, 95% of the recycled goods stayed within Canada, 95%. So I'm not sure what it is Canada wide, but what we were getting at under that contract, that's what we were told was happening. So I appreciate definitely clarification now that we're changing. Well, I do know that the um, when we um, with the Society Via, we have a very good uh, relationship with them, even though we um, concluded our contract with them. Uh, they're very gracious and welcome us back at any time if it doesn't work out uh, with the Woodstock company. So in that regard, I mean, everything is really quite nice. Um, but I will get that clarification from Tricia and just send out a little email to everybody. Dennis, well, it's, um, it's, it's in a little bit more depth than that because it's what they're saying at the market marketplace. What their what their comments were is that it may be going to a Canadian uh, company for recycling, but then the company, some of them are put right into the landfill. So you're wasting your time by having separate recycling. Some of it's going to Malaysia, and they had they had everything all right there. A good documentary on it. And, and uh, the problems they're having over there with the, with the waste and whatnot and the pollution is enormous. So and there's three different places that it was happening, different things. And this was all out of British Columbia. 
Recycling. Okay, British Columbia. Okay, so if you find that link, Dennis, online and you want to send it out to the board, feel free so that we can all see the uh, the documentary that you're referring to. I assume you're talking about the CBC um, yeah, program that's called the Marketplace, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. We'll all right. Find that online. Yeah, so find it online. If somebody finds the link and wants to share it, feel free so we can all watch it and see and then uh, and use it for our own reference to see how we're stacking up here in New Brunswick. So at least from, from what we're doing with our little corner of the province. Thank you, Dennis. Any other questions relating from anything that might've been missed? No. All right, so at this point in time, our next board meeting has been set. Oh, did I hear? No, okay. At this point in time, we'd be looking for um, question and answers with the public. If anybody who has joined us as a guest has a question, certainly just uh, feel free to that little hit that little raise your hand button and uh, we'll be taking questions. And if any have come in through Facebook or YouTube, uh, Alex, certainly let us know. Are there any uh, questions from the public? Do you have to put down some kind of uh, a bummer Sorry. here, what the rentals men require? <laughs> That's our... Pardon me? That, sorry, that was our uh, video on YouTube being played. I was just checking there. We don't have comments on YouTube, Madam Chair, sorry. Uh, okay. But if uh, the attendees um, wish to speak, I'm not sure if they're able to do a raise hand. So may I suggest I'll allow Ed Arsenault to talk. And if he wishes to speak, uh, he can let us know. If not, we'll go to the next one, which would be Jason Cadet. Certainly. Uh, Alex, do, do are they uh, waiting? You want to go ahead? So, Ed, if you want to chat, you can just unmute and let us know. If not, you can keep your mute on. No, I have no comments. Thanks, Alex. No problem. Thank you for joining us, Ed. All right. Now going to uh, Jason Godet. Jason, if you wanted to, to say something, you can uh, mute yourself. Nope. All good. Thank you. Thanks for joining right. us, Jason. All right. We've come to the end of our agenda, and it's time to look for... A motion to adjourn. <laughs> Dennis is always on that. Good to see you all. Have a wonderful weekend. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.